Hello everyone, it's Dylan from Yu-Gi-Oh! Everything, and welcome back to another episode of Appreciating Yu-Gi-Oh! This is a series that I've been doing with my friend Rarity Fangirl, where we look back at different Yu-Gi-Oh! topics, either anime or manga, and we discuss just our overall thoughts on them. We, we try to do a pretty deep dive on whatever topic we are discussing. This is our fourth episode. If you want to see the other three, I'll have the playlist linked in the description. Uh, we did a video on the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga, a video on the Duel Monsters anime subbed, and a video on Dark Side of Dimensions slash Transcend Game. And in today's video, we're going to be kind of doing a multi-part video almost, although it's not really multi-part because it's going to be within one video. We are going to talk about, of course, the very famous uh, English dub of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! series, Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Monsters. We're also going to be talking about the Pyramid of Light movie, which was really the first Yu-Gi-Oh! movie and... Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of us remember that. I've done a couple of videos recently on it. I just rewatched it not too long ago, and that was a dub-produced uh, movie that came out in the dub before it came out in Japan. A little bit of a fun fact there. And then, of course, we are going to be discussing uh, Capsule Monsters as well, which was only a dub product. So this is kind of going to be like a, a 4K, 4 kids uh, part of the video. And before I continue to ramble on, I want to bring in Rarity. Rarity Fangirl, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Hello, everyone. It's great to be back. Um, and we're going to talk about some fun um, nostalgia, and hopefully we'll get to talk some of our favorite uh, one-liners, because that's one of the things that the dub is very famous for, is those lovable <laughs> one-liners. But I'll try to talk about some of the more sophisticated elements coming from a person who's done um, voice acting for fun, but just kind of looked in that side a little bit more from my theater background. Um, so... Yeah, I'm excited yeah. to be here and talk about all these cool things, including to hear what Dylan thinks of Capsule Monsters, because he's never talked about it on this channel before. So that, That's right. This If you were not in the Twitch stream, which is now lost to time, I believe, this is the only time that I will be talking about, or the fir not the only time, the first time I will be talking about uh, Capsule Monsters. So if you've always wondered my thoughts on it, uh, you'll get it. I actually just watched it for the first time like two months ago. I had ne It was one of the only pieces of Yu-Gi-Oh! media I had never seen or watched. And that changed uh, earlier this past summer. So very excited to talk about that. But of course, we got to start with probably one of the most famous English dubs, I would say, ever. Obviously, this happened at the, you know, anime craze in the early 2000s, you know, when Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, really just kind of took over the Saturday morning cartoon slot. And while a lot of people have, you know, a lot of... I'd say mixed opinions on the English dub. There is a massive element of nostalgia for many of us. And like, honestly, this was the bridge to many people getting into Yu-Gi-Oh! When you were eight, nine, 10 years old in the you know early 2000s, you turned it on, you heard Dan Green's Yu-Gi or Eric Stewart's Kaiba. Um, you know, it, it would just seem like the coolest freaking thing in the world, uh, the most intense thing in the world. And then, you know, as you get older, I know some people have, including myself, you know, you start kind of delving into the uh, subbed versions, right? The original versions. And, you know, you can have two reactions. It's like, oh, wow, this is very, very different. Or, wow, this is like much more intense. And I, I prefer this version a lot more. Those are usually kind of the, the two routes that, that you take. Um, I feel like when you kind of look back at the Yu-Gi-Oh! English dubs, but it would be a disservice to not call the Yu-Gi-Oh! dub one of the most influential dubs probably of all time as Four Kids was one of the uh, primary dubbing companies in the world probably ever, to be totally honest with you, uh, no matter whether your opinion is, is positive or negative on them. But Rarity, I kind of want to start there. I mean, when you think of the Yu-Gi-Oh! English dub, like what are some of the things that, that come to mind? Um, so I'm, I'm, I think that's a really cool um, way to start. So for me, I think I talked about this in the sub video. If I'm going to rewatch DM, nine times out of 10, I'm going to rewatch the dub because it's so much fun and chill to have it in the background. Um, I never grew up on it. I mean, I guys told you guys I'm a 5Ds girl, so I have a lot of nostalgia for the 5Ds dub in particular. Um, when I first started Yu-Gi-Oh!, but I think I discovered DM after that, when, um, anime episodes were still fully available on YouTube, right? Hmm. When you could do that, um, through some- some companies are doing it now, like, you can watch all of Vanguard legally on YouTube because Bushy Road likes marketing it that way. Um, I wish that they would put, like, let's say, the Yu-Gi-Oh! sub officially on websites, yeah, be not fantastic. behind the paywall. Um, but at least, as far as I know, all the original dub is on Yu-Gi-Oh!'s website. I think the dub's through Arc 5, if I remember correctly. 
um, are all on there, um, all legally available. Um, so that's great if you want to rewatch it in an official space. I know Netflix has some of it as well. I actually own the entire dub on box set. I got it a long time ago. And it was the thing that even though I knew the subcontext when I got older, it was just so much fun watching these characters and the differences between them and kind of the realizing how much they translated and how much was ad-libbed. Um, do you remember the famous line with the candy bars in Duelist Kingdom with Joey and Yugi um, about like, what was it, like burning the candy bars? Apparently that was ad-libbed. Um, that they oh, added in really there. yeah i know yeah. i know a decent amount of it was not like a crazy amount but i do know there were lines that were ad-libbed because i interviewed some of those voice actors um the voice mm -hmm. actor of mokuba the voice actor of marrick um on my um voices from the shadow realm series and yeah i they would sometimes tell me like yeah some of those were were just ad-libbed uh what we came up with they weren't even on the script yeah and ad-libbing something that i know that in my voice acting projects i've always encouraged my actors to do um, especially if they think it fits in the character really well. And it kind of like adds something to the performance, just kind of gives it that little little edge there. I think ad libbing's a great thing. And dubs kind of allow you that flexibility, specifically the Yu-Gi-Oh dubs, because again, they're nine times out of 10, not always show accurate in terms of the original script. I think that the core story is mostly the same. Like, if you were to say, let's say we broke down Duelist Kingdom into, like, two sentences, between the two versions, it's pretty the same. It's the small details and some of the character motivations that are slightly tweaked, but the general vibe is still the same. They might have just taken out some nuance or, of course, anything related to all the censorships, which I know Dylan's made plenty of videos about the censorship. And to be fair, I remember, I think I was listening to a panel from Eric Stewart, um, which fun fact, Eric Stewart actually voice directed the first season of the dub of DM. The rest of it was by Pegasus's voice actor. His name is escaping me. Who Darren actually Dunstan. And he yeah, still yeah. does the, the voice, yeah, voice directing direction. today. Yeah. 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 That's amazing that he's still around, but yeah, Eric yep. Stewart did the first, the first, um, season. Um, and he was telling us that a lot of those changes had to be approved by the, um, you know, the, the government officials, like every change they had to get approved. And that's just how the, you know, things for television work, especially we got to think the culture that this was made in. Now, do I think that they could recreate a dub today to be more accurate? There was the Yu-Gi-Oh! Uncut dub from 4Kids. I'm sure you have heard of that before. Yep. Um, and I've seen it. Um, and I got to say, it's it's great, but it's not as good. It, it feels weird because... Not it's not what this, we're used to, yeah. No, yeah. and the voices I don't think feel as... I think they just felt more stilted a little bit because the dialogue was translated word for word. And I think there's a fine balance between direct translation and vocalization that when it comes to dubs... I watch a lot of dubbed anime. Um, and I think that's where a lot of long-running series, when they have dubs, um, I think that there is, again, that fine line between being accurate to the source material but also what sounds better for an english speaking audience that's why there's an art to localization that's why localization and translation are two different careers they're two different um things like um this isn't Yu-Gi-Oh related but i know for vanguard they eventually i think because they were dubbed by ocean who did some of the early dragon ball dub in canada and I remember as the series one, I think when we got to the end of G or something, that the dub didn't sound as good to me. And I think it's because the localization and also voice direction, there's two of those little things there. Um, and that can make a big difference because I never blame the actors if there's like a faulty line because it's usually the voice direction. It's what the voice director wants to hear and what the company wants. Um, actors do the best that they can um, with what they're given. And I always give big respect to everyone who works on a product and I always think that the Yu-Gi-Oh dubs in terms of talent, like the voice actors are super talented. I don't think we need to say that. We already know the big names like Eric Stewart, Dan Green, um, Tara Sands, you guys know I love Okuba, Tara Sands is fantastic. Wayne Grayson as Joey yep. um, as well. He was fantastic. And all those little things that have to do with localization, like I think translating Joey's Yankee, basically he's like in Japanese, like a Yankee to like this kind of street thug kind of like, Brooklyn voice, it's not a thousand percent, but it conveys in an English speaking audience that Joey's kind of like st street smart. It conveys <laughs> yeah. that to what an American audience would understand, right? And and there's that's a big thing too. I could talk about the name translations, but I don't think all of them were necessarily like, I like Weevil Underworld more than I like Professor Haga, to be honest with you. Some of the names I thought were improvements. 
Like, I love Maximilian Pegasus more than I like Pegasus J. Crawford, for example. But uh, yeah, I would I would agree with you. I, I would agree. Actually, some of the name changes I I did like I I always loved the my Valentine pun. Like yes. it's so like dumb, but it it works for some reason. And, and then they kept <laughs> a lot of the other names. Like I think changing Malik to Merrick because of the way that Japanese pronounce the word. Um, as well, like Ashizu is Isis, like how you would um, spell it, but they pronounce it Ashizu. And I think just keeping the pronunciation the same um, as well, uh, I think was great. So I think the localization team did the best they could with um, at least, I would say the DM um, voice, I mean, um, name changes, I don't think are too bad. I think there's some in the later Yu-Gi-Oh dubs, which I don't think we're going to do separate videos on those. We'll probably touch on them, but the DM dub is just so iconic in its own right. We thought it deserved its own place. Um, but... I think that most of the time that they were pretty good. I'm surprised, like, Mokuba and Seto's names didn't get changed. I, I like that theirs got to say the same. Obviously, Yugi and Tem and Yami got to keep theirs. And I don't think changing, like, Joe Nochi to Joey is that bad. It's kind of the same similar sounding. I mean, a lot of people in the fandom just call Joey Joe anyway. You're just adding a Y. Yeah. I mean, then there's, like, yeah. Honda to Tristan and, like, Taya to, like, uh, Anzu to Taya. Like, there, there's some names that aren't as good but but then you have great alliteration like rex raptor that is a cool name <laughs> like it, it is it is for, especially for like a dinosaur guy like yes it's on it's like very much on the nose but and in your face but that's also like what kind of makes the english dub like appealing you know like it, it is like right in your face but it also works with the the characters that they're changing these mm -hmm. names for exactly and i think that kind of works and one of the things i think is very underrated about the dub in general is the ost is it the same as the japanese version no but i really love a lot of the motifs especially in the millennium world they added a lot of um egyptian instruments a lot of string a lot of flute it sounded just really really nice and of course we have the iconic themes like kaiba's hacking theme is like iconic by this point yes it is of course the kaiba hacking theme the egyptian god theme the seal of ori Kalkos theme the toon world theme i mean come on the toon world yep. theme like all of those are so iconic and then you also got to remember the insert songs they had at the beginning because pokemon also had insert songs and they stopped doing that but then they had the kaiba song of pyramid of light which was like one of the best parts of that movie even though i'm like eric stewart's a singer they should have had him sing it give us a kaiba musical number in his head as a musical fan that would have made me so happy um but non-diegetic musical numbers are also also good to have um so in terms of the script changes we know there were plenty but i think there were some cases that I think they still hit on a lot of the same points and there's actually some inconsistency like for example in season one um kaiba directly mentions that him and mokuba's parents died but then afterwards they never say that word again funny enough like they say that they disappeared not died but they said died in season one i think it's episode like 20 or something that he says yeah it. that 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 is really interesting there yeah i mean you know th there were some like pretty major changes the one that i always think of as well is like you know in the original marrick was just his goal yami marrick at least was just to kill the pharaoh right it was just as straight up and simple as that and then in the english dub they changed it where he wanted to get the three god cards and like all the millennium items and so you do have like you know storyline changes like that and like when you're watching the dub like you don't think anything of it it's not like it it feels like a weird goal for him to have because like the way the no. dub writes it you would think that if he has all of those items and the god cards like he could probably rule the world right that's like a very generic and typical like villain goal so like you know that that works as well um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, as, as you said, like the script changes, the censorship, I mean, that, that is all what a lot of people think about when it comes to the dub. And, and something that I love is it almost gives us like two different shows in a way a thousand um, where percent. You're, you're almost watching like two different shows. And I think that that is something that is kind of cool. Yeah, agreed. Um, a lot of shows don't have that. And as much as like... In an ideal world, we would have, let's say, a more accurate dub, like if Yu-Gi-Oh! Uncut, let's say, got finished, which it was successful, by the way. It sold well. There were other reasons why it shut down. I think um, some YouTuber made a video about it. I don't remember who it was, um, about Yu-Gi-Oh! Uncut. But I think it's just really, really cool. And especially if you're in like the creative community, combining headcanons between the different versions, like, 
I'm pretty sure the entire Kaiba Brothers, like, fandom calls Mokuba Moki. Like, they still use that, and that's a dub thing. He doesn't say that in the Japanese. That cute little nickname that Kaiba eventually stops because, you know, he went through crap to kind of show that he's not the same person. It's a simple thing, but it adds so much little characterization. And that's what I really love is kind of having multiple different texts to pull from as someone who is involved in the creative community. I think that really, really helps. And even characters like even have different performances. Like, for example, one of the most notable is um, Noah. Noah's voice actor in the Japanese was very calm, very calculating. But in the dub, he sounds like a brat, which is what I'd perfectly expect from a spoiled kid stuck in a computer. Right? Right. Like, you'd yeah. perfectly expect him to sound like that. And then you have people... Um, like Pegasus, who sounds exactly how you'd imagine he sounds in English, like well, exactly yeah, and I honestly way. like if you sound right, that that's almost like one to one. I mean, what they did with Pegasus, which works so well for his character, where like if you listen to him in the original version and then you listen to him in the English dub, the inflection in his voice is almost identical. Oh, it's it's perfect, and people are like, does he say the boy thing? Is that the dub thing? I'm like, no, he says it in the Japanese too. He says it in the manga yeah. too. That's not an English dub thing. No, that that's an original thing that they kept, which. I love that they kept. Um, and of course, we have to talk about the the comedy. I mean, so many Yu-Gi-Oh! dub lines should be on t-shirts. I think I saw recently they made an official t-shirt of, It should have been me! When well, the Pharaoh loses. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, that is... Would you say that is the most famous line from the English dub? Because I, I would say that's the most famous line. Uh, I, I think that's part of one. The one I always remember is the... Uh, what is it? Um... At first, you don't succeed. Blast him with your blue eyes again. Or the Kaiba line where he says, Nah, as the president of a major corporation, I have to do that every day. That's yeah, the, yeah. That, it's that, like, those right, are the Kaiba ones that I yeah. see. <laughs> um, and then, obviously, those are the main ones that I'd see. But there's a lot of funny little jokes and characterization changes that are kind of nice. Like, I think the English dub, like, because sometimes, you know, dubs give additional dialogue where there wasn't originally in subs because they got that room. And, like, I know they gave, like, for example, like, some other characters who maybe didn't speak in a scene more dialogue than they had before. Again, additional opportunities for character development and characterization, um, which I think is a big strength. And it just feels so good to watch it. I've had the Yu-Gi-Oh! dub in the background working on um, graduate student work that stresses me out just to have something in the background. It's so comforting and it's fun to watch with people. It's such a fun ride. And not to say other Yu-Gi-Ohs or the subversion isn't. It's a different kind of vibe, different vibe. And I think that that's a great thing to have. And again, it was the gateway for many people. And honestly, if I had a kid, I'd show them the original dub. I think I've done that to try to introduce people. It's the easiest way, I think, to introduce someone to Yu-Gi-Oh! Like why Yu-Gi-Oh! is so cool. It is the dub kind of exaggerates all the cool things we love about Yu-Gi-Oh! into a very obvious way. And that's because, I mean, it was appealing to kids. So they had to go a little bit over the top. And I think because Yu-Gi-Oh! is very crazy when you break it down. I mean, if you guys have heard what's happening to Yu-Gi-Oh! Go Rush, we have some crazy stuff going on there, right? Like, Yu-Gi-Oh! is very oh, exaggerated. Yeah. And that's kind of part of the fun of it. And the dub makes full advantage of the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh! is this crazy series where anything can happen. Anything crazy can happen with trading cards. Yep, and that that is uh, you know always kept its identity at the end of the day. But yeah, you know whether you love it or hate it, when it comes to the dub, I mean it is one of the most I think well known popular dubs. Um, you know, finger guns is another classic meme that that uh, stemmed yes. from obviously the the censorship to uh, remove guns. Another element that we haven't even brought up which I actually think is an incredible element, is the Shadow Realm. Um, uh, a lot of yes. people don't even realize the Shadow Realm is an English dub-only concept that really replaces, in most cases, death, where, like, straight-up death would be referenced or done in the show. You know, if a character would be sent to the Shadow Realm, uh, that was really them dying in the original version. Um, but the Shadow Realm, this purple, evil dimension realm, you know, at this point, I think most people do realize that it's just kind of a dub thing. And it has been kind of, like, memed to a lot of degrees. Uh, but, like, when you take a step back, I think the Shadow Realm is almost creepier than the concept it's, of death itself, it's right? Like it's it, hell, it, it, basically. It's described as this, like, almost purgatory area where you're just, like, in this, like, liminal space uh, where you're in, like, pain constantly. Like, that sounds way worse than death to me. So, you know, they, they almost, like, I always say, I feel like accidentally they almost created a concept that was even more, 
more terrifying than death, but because of that like cartoonish element, it, it worked for the times, um, and it allowed them to kind of like instead of have death, you know, with I always think of like the blades and the uh, Arcana duel, where Arcana, you know, the, the duels of the Dark Magician, uh, Arcana the versus Dark Yama Energy Yugi, Discs, and with the, the chainsaw blades, and it's like in the dub, you know, they were purple blades, and as soon as they touched your leg, you'd be sent to the Shadow Realm. <laughs> the like, Dark it, Energy it's so ridiculous, but yeah. it's so funny looking back on it, and I think that's what like also made the dub so memorable. Oh, exactly. I perfectly, I perfectly agree with that. Um, again, the Dark Energy Discs. Um, the dark, really that's fun. what they were called. Yeah, yeah the Dark just, Energy Discs. Genuinely uh, just the funniest yeah. thing. But, and I think, you know, yeah. yeah. And I think that kind of leads into talking about Pyramid of Light is you got to remember, because we're going to transition to that. Um, Pyramid of Light has some pretty creepy stuff in it. I got to admit. And it's funny because I recently watched Pyramid of Light in Japanese. Funny enough. I actually watched it in Japanese. Um, there are some things that are different, of course, um, than the original. It was kind of cool to see, like, a 4Kids product, because I think Pyramid of Light was originally written by them, and I think they wrote the story of it, as far as I'm aware, and they commissioned, um, Gallup to make it as, like, with Capsule Monsters. Um, it was interesting to see the differences in story, um, for example, um, but that movie is quite the ride, um... It's a it's a fun it's it's a fun movie, but I think it's one of those. There's some great moments in it. Like it's really cool. It has great animation. Um, one of my favorite details is that there's blue eyes tune wine when Kaiba's talking to Pegasus. That's what's on the wine bottle, <laughs> which I think is hilarious. One of my friends was like, "Tune wine yeah, <laughs> exists." Yeah. That's a, that's a cool detail. I don't know what the year is referencing for that. Um, but, like, I think that there's, again, um, I think at the sub they talked about um, Kaiba being, like, the warrior of light or the king of light fighting the king of darkness, which is a Tem, which you could argue is foreshadowing to, um, you know, pre-Seto and a Tem, in a sense, because Kaiba's always been associated with light despite being a very darker character, and a Tem's always been associated with darkness, and he's, like, you know, the hero, which I think lays to the whole Yu-Gi-Oh! theme, where we see this of characters like Judai, for example, in GX, that darkness doesn't necessarily mean evil and light doesn't always mean good. So they kind of introduced that in a really obvious way in the film, which I really liked. Um, and as always, there's some funny lines, like, I think that's the first time Joey says the godfather of games, which I think that's great. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. That's yep. a fun line. Um, Pyramid of Light's a fun ride. Um, but I don't think it's something I would rewatch. And I'd say of the films that we have, I'd say it's the weakest. Still fun, yeah. but has yeah. some weaker moments in it. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, um, I actually, this, this um, you know, past weekend, I, I uploaded a video on one of the just worst kind of duel writing errors that I can remember in a, in a duel where um, the Paladin of White Dragon wasn't counted towards the Blue Eye Shining Dragon attack boost, even though that was clearly a dragon. So that's the one that, like, always, I always think of that when I think of Pyramid of Light. Um, I also think of Anubis, who I think is a pretty forgettable villain. I just did my Pyramid of Light, like, formal review on the channel not too long ago, which I'll, I'll link down below. And yes, I, I have gone on record saying... To me, that's like the weakest piece of Yu-Gi-Oh! media I think ever, ever made. Um, it, you know, it, it is, it is like fun, but it just is very like lacking to me. And it's always felt to me, and I don't know if you feel this way, it's always felt to me that it was like a bit of an attempt at like a further cash grab oh. when the dubbing anime was at its like thousand, peak. You know what I mean? thousand percent it was a cash grab. I mean, it was an investment. Four kids paid for it. So it was an investment. It was something that they needed. Um, and, you know, it sold tickets. Um, I think I'm glad we got um, Dark Tide Dimensions, but um, later as well. And then Bonds yeah. Beyond Time, yeah. which we'll talk about those, obviously. We'll talk about DSD. We'll talk about Bonds Beyond Time probably after we do 5Ds. Um, but for sure. Um, I think that definitely has those vibes, um, but I still love that they made the effort, um, obviously the extra money, like you got to see more detail in the shading, there was some nice lighting, the effects were good, the animation was very pretty, and they actually put in the English card text, and the Japanese version has the Japanese card text. DSOD did that too, you can tell that was a movie budget thing. Um, I think, I think Bonds Beyond Time also did that with the full text of the full card. I don't remember off the top of my head if it did. Um, I'll remember to do that when we look for that film. 
Um, but but yeah, I think one of the the funny moments was the mummies, and they're all just fighting the mummies, and then like when yeah. Pet in the Dark Clown stabs the Tem, and they make it like this long, drown out sequence. The best thing about Pyramid of Light, besides the animation, is I think the concept of an anti-millennium puzzle is cool, but like we could have had these anti-millennium items at that point. But the millennium items are also kind of evil, but I don't know if the writers knew that, because I don't think the manga was completely finished yet. So right, like, where, the, not. where the so origins right, came from. That. So that would have been interesting. Um, so... I'm interested that you said Pyramid of Light is not is not the the worst is the worst piece of Yu-Gi-Oh at least or weakest you could say. So that means Capsule Monsters isn't was it's either one of those two things that I see fans uh, talk about. <laughs> um, yes. So Dylan, reveal to the world what or, or rather who were in the stream, which is probably quite a number of your audience. What is your yes. opinion on the Capsule Monsters mini series? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll tell you this. I watched it in in a one shot. Uh, Twitch stream. So yeah, there were probably about 60, 70 people. So I'm sure, you know, obviously a lot of people were not part of that stream uh, that don't know my thoughts on this. So watched it in one sitting, took like four or five hours, didn't really know anything about it going into it. Just that it's the only piece of Yu-Gi-Oh! animated media that does not have a subbed version, right? It's it's only the dub. Um, yes. So like that is already very interesting. Um, I, you know, I'll be honest, like, Crapsule Monsters, right? I've heard that said for the last 15 years. Oh, Crapsule yes. Monsters, Yu-Gi-Oh! Crapsule Monsters. I expected it, and I think maybe my perception of this series is a little higher than most because my expectations were just so low. Like, I was expecting, like, unwatchable, almost, um, elements here. Um, yeah, Capsule Monsters, I do not think is necessarily, like, good, but I also don't think it's, like, horrible. Um, I There were elements that I actually really did enjoy. Like, I really, really enjoyed seeing a Thames, like, armor upgrades oh, yeah. um, as the series went on. I actually thought some of those moments were really, really hyped. Um, the villain was, like, okay. I mean, it's kind of weird. They used, like, right a, a real person in Alexander the Great. I mean, obviously, very, very far off in the past but um you know i i thought the the villain was like nothing special but i think there was more to his character than like anubis for instance who was the the villain of, of pyramid of light and i'm only comparing the two because i actually do agree with your point i think most people feel either pyramid of light or capsule monsters is like probably the weakest element of like the entire Yu-Gi-Oh discography when you compare like all the anime manga spin-offs you know whatever mm -hmm. um but like there were elements that I enjoyed of the story I, I like I I enjoyed them like going to the village only for like the village to then be like disappeared and like trying to figure out the riddle of like the the voice in the wind and you know there were elements like the mystery elements that I actually did find pretty I'm enjoyable you know when it ended I think I said I'd give it like a five and a half out of 10, which obviously, you know, is not really a, a great rating, but it's mm. also not like an abysmal rating no. for reference. Pyramid of light is probably like a four, four and a half for me. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, like I, I do find, I do think it was more enjoyable overall than pyramid of light was for me personally, not by a crazy amount, but I definitely do not hate it as much as I thought I would. And I definitely don't hate it as much as a lot of people do. Um, I, I'd love to know your thoughts. I'll let you say your big complaint. Okay. I'm not going to spoil it for people watching. And by the I'm, way, when Rarity says her big complaint, I am in full agreement with with what she's going to say. Um, so anyway, the floor the floor is yours. I don't know what your thoughts on it. I'd, I'd love to hear um, your thoughts as well so in general. One thing I'm surprised you didn't mention real quick about what you liked. I'm sure you loved the red eyes armor, considering you were a red the red eyes, eyes armor was incredible. Yes, of course, the black <laughs> that, luster. That I mean, a lot of it, and also the maze. Like I loved the paradox duel is one the, one of my favorite duels with the paradox brothers. Yeah. Um, the labyrinth maze, and I felt like they kind of took elements of that when they were in the maze with the labyrinth tank going through it. Like there were some pretty like fun and enjoyable it's, moments it, for it, me. It, it gives me like the vibe of like let's say we went to the dual monster spirit world kind of had an arc in there so it had some elements in there that i liked i liked the characters outfits new outfits yeah. it's so weird because this is clearly an alternate universe it doesn't make sense for it to be in the regular canon though if it is an alternate universe here's my biggest complaint um i'm sure if you know me very well this is not a surprise you know capsule monsters this is not the first time capsule monsters is a thing right it's in the manga 
And that's Mokuba's game. And him and Kaiba are not even mentioned. That <laughs> yeah. is so weird. You wouldn't have the Capsule Monsters character. And I know the original anime never acknowledged it, but clearly they didn't acknowledge it in the original... Season Zero acknowledged it, though. I'm still salty, which I'll get to that in the Season Zero video, that the first Capsule Monsters game in the Season Zero anime was not Mokuba playing it with some random guy with Miho. It wasn't the- <laughs> Mokuba didn't get his time to shine until the end, so he just felt like this weird kid who came out of nowhere if you didn't read the source material. But the absence of Kaiba and Mokuba feels so weird. Like, you had Blue Eyes had this cool moment. Could you imagine how angry Kaiba would be? You took my monster in this cool armor. Could you imagine Blue Eyes armor Kaiba? It'd be like Seto Rosencruz and Duels of the Roses. It would have been awesome. You yes. had the design by that point. It was right there. And no. And I think the ex exclusion of Kaiba and Mokuba, or even just Kaiba, I know I'm Mokuba biased, but even just Kaiba in the main group is as much as I love Grandpa and him getting to do stuff, Kaiba would have made it a lot more interesting because he wouldn't play nice with the group. We already know he wouldn't. He never does. But it would have been an interesting situation and also highlight that Kaiba is a master of games, not just dueling. This would also show that that again you could even also reference hey i learned how to play from my brother or something like again little details referencing that but that's probably my biggest complaint is is that but in terms of its overall structure um i think the the joey red eyes episode is one of the coolest parts shoddy showing up was a little weird i think the concept of using more historical figures kind of expanding the historical fiction part of Yu-Gi-Oh, right um so i think that was an interesting idea that maybe had better could have been better executed um i liked giving like the rest of the crew they're all monsters i love that gramps had some of the cards from yugi's deck which makes sense remember yugi got his deck from his grandpa absolutely originally yep. so that was really cool i liked that everybody had the dragon at the end and then the armor design which is super over designed but conceptually power of friendship armor was cool and I always love them doing different things besides game, um, besides dual monsters in Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. Like, again, I love the Millennium World for that reason, the kind of monster kaiju fights. So it was a nice change of pace. Would I watch it again, aside from maybe the Joey Red Eyes episode, because I thought that was cool. I mean, evil Joey is always a fun ride after, you know, Merrick and stuff. Sure. But again, I think the lack of the Kaiba brothers, I think, is just such a big missed opportunity. And I'm thinking about it from a marketing standpoint. Kaiba's, like, arguably the most popular Yu-Gi-Oh character to exist. More than a Tem. Even in Japan. Like, Kaiba's merch sells out almost instantly. Every time. So the dude is still popular. And he was back then. Why would they not include him? It just feels like a weird decision. Uh, and it's I not that Eric Stewart agree. wasn't around. He was in GX. He was also in 5Ds. He was still around, dubbing. So... What what the heck? Like you couldn't, like because I think it came out around when Yu-Gi-Oh! Cut was coming out. So like clearly, yep, yeah. So it's just a weird decision. But overall, um, just kind of wrapping up in terms of the capsule monsters, it's a really cool ride. I think the idea of it is just it's not the same capsule monsters as was in the original manga. It's not the same game. It again was probably to sell the video game, which I know you recently played. Which I think the video game is really interesting. I I love that video. I wish game, yeah. I wish Mokuba was the final boss though. It would have made more sense, but you know. <laughs> well, let, let, you might let be my... biased, but yes, I know what you're saying. <laughs> he should have been a higher level boss than the Area Two boss. Come on, give give the Capsule Monsters kid, which they reference respect. I I, I promise, guys. This this it's it's. I'm sure when we get to 5Ds, Dylan will be talking about Aki for, like, the whole video, so we can have our favorite character bias in the video. That's the whole point of appreciating <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh! I'm sure we'll get to the that, which I agree. Oh, that'll Aki's be great. fun. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I do fully agree. The, the omission of the Kaiba brothers, and even just Seto Kaiba, was a weird decision and i will also say when it comes to capsule monster coliseum if you are one of those people i know there are people out there and it's fine it's an opinion that really do not enjoy dubs or specifically like the Yu-Gi-Oh dubs you probably will not find it enjoyable at all because it's not like there's the japanese version you can watch like this is the only piece of media that is dub only and i think the reason that it gets as much hate as it does is because there is no like subbed version if you will and i think there's a lot more people that just can't like that find the english dub to be cringe i mean me and you are not 
those people, but there are a lot of people that are like that. I, I respect and the dubs. with all the other pieces of Yu-Gi-Oh! media, you can always go back and like watch the subversion and then judge the story based on that. You can't do that with this product. I think that's why this product does get um, even more hate. But I think when you, like, if you don't mind the dub, I, I think I think it's fine. I think it's fun. And just like you, Rarity, I don't mind when they do some non-Yu-Gi-Oh stuff, like in terms of not doing the game. So I, I think it's I think it's a good time over. Well, it's it's a good time overall. That's not to say it's good. You know, it, it, it's fine. It is what it is. Uh, it's Capsule Monsters, you know. But anyway, um, man, this has been a lot of fun. Just to give you guys a quick preview as to what to look forward to, um, we're wrapping up the Duel Monsters era here of the Appreciating Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, segment with two more videos. The next video is going to cover the Yu-Gi-Oh! R manga, which is a manga that I have actually not made any content on here on this channel. And then we are going to do Season Zero, the infamous Season Zero, the Toei Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. So we are going to be covering both of those, and then we will be moving on to GX, 5Ds, so on and so forth. Plenty more installments of the Appreciating Yu-Gi-Oh! series to come, um, which I hope you are looking forward to. And of course, I hope you enjoyed this episode on 4Kids. Uh, Rarity, anything you would like to say before we check out? And guys, please make sure you check out Rarity's channel. I will link it down below in the description. <laughs> Um, thank you, Dylan. Um, I know that I haven't uploaded in like since the beginning of the year. Um, being a PhD student is a lot of work, but just know as I announced my Arc 5 project, we're still working on it. Um, a lot of the stuff is being made by hand by just, you know, people just coming together for fun. So obviously that takes a lot of time, but I hope to have at least have a teaser product at the end of this year. We have a lot of the materials for it and it's going to be super, super fun and rewarding once that gets done. I've always been a quality over quantity person. And one of these days, Dylan, you and I got to do a dueling stream because that would be... I mean, we got to do some kind of stream together at some point. So I would love to do that. We can discuss that more later. Um, but that would be fun. Um, I do agree. Some master, master duel or some um, duel links stuff, especially with the new um, rush duel stuff that has come yeah. to the game. Yeah, of course. Now, we'll, we'll, we'll think of something. We'll, we'll cook something up. But yeah, guys, keep an eye out on Rarity's channel. Give her a follow. Give the Twitter a follow if you want some some updates. And uh, I will say, when I, it's worth the wait. I mean, I, I'm not even you know sure what it is, but Rarity, I can tell you, does really good work. So it'll be worth the wait. And uh, you know, if you want to see some backlog of older videos, she's uploaded a lot of really cool Arc 5 manga dubs. It's all on her channel, so please check it out. But guys, thank you all so much for watching. Rarity, thank you so much for joining me as always for the Appreciating Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast. I greatly, greatly appreciate it. Please leave all your thoughts on Capsule Monsters, Pyramid of Light, the English dub for DM, down below in the comments. Next episode will, of course, be um, Yu-Gi-Oh! R. So look forward to that. Thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have an, an amazing, amazing day. day. Take care, guys. <laughs>